everyone and welcome to the Harvard Business School online virtual event. My name is Gwen Dinaradze. I'm the business consultant, lecturer, founder and CEO of Speakers Alliance Canada, an international speaking and consulting company and the Harvard Business School online global chapter lead. Today, it is my great pleasure to facilitate this virtual interview and host a professional speaker author and expert in healthcare and culture, Sarah McDaniel. I will get back to Sarah's introduction in a few minutes, but now I want to speak a little bit about the global chapter. The global chapter is getting bigger and bigger. Many business professionals who have taken at least one course at Harvard are joining us um, as well as my team is getting bigger and we are excited to facilitate even more interesting and insightful events and interviews. Many people have found the global chapter beneficial. Some of them found jobs after our networking sessions. Some of us found like-minded people around the globe. And I want to remind you to use today's session as a source of networking with others from all over the world. And as a great opportunity to listen and learn from one of the world's true leaders in culture and healthcare such as Sarah McBainel. I uh, shared my LinkedIn uh, link uh, in the chat, so I would suggest you to do the same so we can get, it, get in touch with uh, one another. And if you have any questions after the event, you're welcome to reach out to me. Now about Sarah and her impressive background. Sarah is an international recognition, culture and healthcare expert, author and certified speaking professional. Only 63 Canadians hold Certified Speaking Professionals designation. Sarah helps individuals leverage the exponential power of recognition and retain top talent, fuel healthy teams and sustain healthy bottom lines. She speaks nationally on the topic, leads workshops, coaches leaders and conducts organizational recognition program reviews. And she is the author of five books. Today, it is my great pleasure to interview Sarah and speak about a very important topic, especially during this pandemic. Great resignation, keeping at the end attracting great people in the hybrid workspace. Sarah, welcome to the Harvard Business School online global interview and thank you for taking time and joining us today. My pleasure. It's, I'm honored to be here with so many thought leaders from across the globe and uh, to be here with you, Gwen. So thanks for inviting me to have this conversation. I think there's so much we can do to reinvent um, what uh, delightful, delicious, <laughs> workplaces look like so that we come out the other side of this long tail of the pandemic even better off having innovated all the things that we would have had we not even uh, had the opportunity to do so so thrilled to be here sarah everyone is talking about the great resignation can you tell us what it is and what it means for workplaces Depending on where you're coming from around the world, you may or may not have an official great resignation trend. For example, in the US, it's much stronger than it is in Canada. In a nutshell, um, what it is is that people are choosing um, to opt out of traditional work. It could be that they are choosing to go from full-time down to part-time. They could be going back to school. They may be leaving their industry. They um, even, I mean, we started to see some of this beforehand where physicians were, instead of working as many hours as previous generations, they were working four fifths the number of hours of, of our, you know, newer graduate uh, physicians. But the, the but COVID has really exacerbated people's choices because we've had choices, we've lived the choices. Um, so if you don't want to get back in your car and commute to work, perhaps you are finding a way to re reinvent it. And you're willing to sacrifice some job security, perhaps income, maybe a title, moving to more startup businesses rather than corporations that you thought would always be that safe place. Um, and so it's really redefining what work means to you. And this is really a huge impetus um, that I like to share with companies is that if you thought that your competitor was your where your talent is going, 
you you are competing for talent on so many fronts and that is what creating the great resignation is that there's no one place where people are going or where you're losing talent and i'm happy to dive into that a little bit deeper um, but the bottom line i hope that everybody leaves this conversation with is realizing that like any talent um, market where it's a, it's a it's an employee's market rather than the corporation's market People have choices. And now in the great resignation, people's choices are even more infinite than they were before. And they're willing to exercise their choices on the short term and on the long term. It's uh, it's going to take some real reinvention in our workplaces to be able to navigate this. You mentioned Canada and the US. Is the great resignation worldwide? Uh, because we have audience members from India, Asia, Europe. So what would you say about the worldwide resignation? Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, uh, there's there's even debate about if the great resignation is truly a trend in and of itself. Um, one of the things that I think is most helpful, and I'm not an economist by background, my sister and my brother-in-law actually are, so I wish we could have a family you know, conversation here. Um, one of the greatest things that you may want to take a look at is your core demographics. So, you know, in India, for example, the bubble of, of younger workers are, is so much wider than it is in North America. And so you have a much larger generation of people who are in the workforce, who are looking for work, who are building their careers, as opposed to a much, you know, wider sort of, and it, and it starts to slope down in, in North America of those, the people, you know, demographically. So this is actually one of the greatest things that you could do to understand what this looks like in your culture and frankly, how at risk you are of, of there being a massive talent shortage is how big is the influx and the current um, population of people at the prime of their work um, is. Because if you don't even have the population density, then it's then you're even more at risk of the workforce trends. What industries seem to be hardest hit by our talent shortage and uh, workforce changes? And what's new and what has been uh, exacerbated? Yeah, well, certainly industries where there's a very high reliant on part-time um, workforce, for example, in the hospitality and restaurant industry, we're seeing that people are choosing not to go back to work, especially when there was a period of time where they weren't working. Um, now it becomes a choice as to if you take that part time job, you may have have taken your four months off, especially if you're furloughed and you didn't feel any love from your employer or from your industry, you may have had to have reinvented and gone back to school or or started that Etsy business on the side. Um, so there is a lot of, of of very cyclical seasonal um, or unreliable in terms of an economic base for workers where people have have been able to make choices and related to that because some of those choices are based on uh, well being wellness um, passion that sometimes people can replace a part time income with an income that's driven by themselves. So the rise of side hustles, we saw that before COVID, the gig economy, we've had gig economies before the pre, you know, in, in industrial revolution where a lot of people were skilled trades who didn't necessarily work full time. We're seeing a resurgence of the, of the gig economy. And so people are people who perhaps had relied on working part time for an employer, we're seeing those industries. And as I say, like hospitality is a great example of one where people don't necessarily have to choose that. And then of course we see industries where people are burnt out, they're compassion fatigue, they're, they're exhausted, they're unhappy, uh, healthcare, um, frontline, not-for-profit industries, uh, fundraisers where philanthropy just took such a nosedive um, in COVID once we had that sort of honeymoon period of, of generous giving and then all of a sudden, you know, people weren't giving. Um, so there's been industries where where people are not feeling the love that they may have felt, felt it for a little while. And, and to be honest, and you mentioned I come out of healthcare, there was a very strong um, disengagement dimension to those those um, industries beforehand anyway, and we weren't truly attending to them. So the fact that we don't have enough people coming out of 
nursing schools and developmental services and pers personal support worker programs. Um, and then we can't, in the pandemic, find people to preset those folks. So we've got all these new grads who can't perhaps find their way into those positions. And even if we find a way around that, that some people have become so disheartened in the process that you've got, you know, there's this cascade effect of it wasn't super satisfying before. The pandemic brought you to your your knees in terms of exhaustion, physical and emotional exhaustion. And then you have this this inability to replace um, some of those people who naturally were on the cusp of retirement and decided to retire because of the their need, their well-being. They go home to their families, their families say, you are not fun to live with. Like, really, could you just retire already? Your pension is good enough. So people choose to opt out, opt out perhaps a little earlier than they would have. Um, and so, you know, without having, the, because of COVID, we had a period of time where we couldn't get the brand new grads into those roles. And then when, you do, when you've got people mass retiring, you don't have people to be able to mentor and precept those people, those brand new grads as well. So there's just, and then on top of it, we have such, such a massive demand mm -hmm. as we have a, you know, continuing to go up. I mean, look at what's happening in some countries such as the UK. I mean, just a massive amount of pressure yet again on the healthcare system. So, so you know, there's there are so many forces that are related to COVID and there's so many things that we have to look at and examine before COVID that weren't necessarily leading us to having a stable workforce anyway. So it's become this kind of this, this clash of forces that have led to people being able to make choices, feeling like I have to make choices for my well-being, and, and also, frankly, the readiness of their family for them to, to make, a, make good choices for their family when uh, perhaps before we felt like we had no choice, we have to have dual income, we have to, you know, we can't retire until we have a certain level of pension. People are completely reimagining what success, financial success, lifestyle success, health success looks like, and work is always going to be squarely put in the middle of that, and it's no longer at the top of the pyramid of what people are consistently prioritizing for decision making in their career. Mm -hmm. Sounds ironic, but it's true. <laughs> Sarah, you mentioned uh, hospitality sector and healthcare sector. Uh, is our current talent crisis because of COVID or are other forces at play? Well, certainly um, the fact that we had low engagement. I mean, if you look at the results of just about any hospital in their, their engagement survey results or their pulse survey results, there is a lot of disengagement and dissatisfaction. I'm a recognition expert. That's what my, my core expertise is when it comes to corporate culture and workforce planning. Um, in environments where we see high satisfaction with recognition, we also statistically see much dramatically higher trust in the organization, satisfaction with leaders, in overall engagement, uh, intention to stay, and continuous improvement and innovation. So you can probably imagine when you look at pulse survey results, such as in healthcare, where we had low engagement, where we had high dissatisfaction, and, and in healthcare, it tends to be around the 10 year mark when people feel really feel disengaged and it's very hard to get them reengaged. It's very hard to get people back. So that is a time where people have a lot of options. So something we need to understand is that whether it's healthcare or other sectors, if your engagement survey, you may call it satisfaction, you may call it pulse surveys, you know, there's there's certainly HR arguments to be made that those are different things, and I would agree with that, but for the sake of our conversation today, we won't get into the semantics and definitions of those. The point is, what was happening before that didn't work has been exacerbated now. So when it comes to healthcare, we like to believe that things were, were okay, um, and frankly, we accepted things that we should have never accepted. Then the vacancy rate, the turnover rate was very high. It can be between 11 and 14% in Canada, for example, and that is considered industry average. Well, think about how much money and time it costs 
to be able to bring a new person into the organization, onboard them. It can take six weeks before somebody is able to, to be independent, coming in with expertise and be able to practice independently on your, your um, electronic medical system and the way you do processing of orders of, of pharmaceutical orders and what you do at the bedside, even though we have standards, accreditation standards for you to truly be ready to use the policies and execute your work the way it is expected in your part of the organization in the system that you're in. And that's with a talent that is with somebody who is very experienced. So, you know, the cost that we were willing to put up with the 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 pain of the you know somebody having to make that choice to move on which was often due to things like lack of growth and development bullying and incivility um you know dis dissatisfaction with the, the, their leader not feeling a sense of meaning and contribution uh concerns about quality standards and safety healthcare is the highest incident industry of any industry and if we thought about that every time we had to go in and get a, you know, a colonoscopy or a mammogram or a diagnostic test, we would be fearful. That's the reality, though. <laughs> so, so think about the cost for not just the, the work, the organization to be able to keep their budget in line, the cost to the existing workforce of, of bearing the brunt of the burden of mentoring and precepting constantly while also having such huge emotional and physical pressures on the body, on the mind, on your emotional state. And then on top of it, think about the burden on the patient and the family member because of this, you know, the, the fact that there's so much newness and there's so much, you know, redeployment that needs to happen and, and, and there's an unstable, consistent human workforce plan. So it's, it's not that um, healthcare organizations weren't doing the best they could. It's just we tolerated a level of turnover that if all it took was one massive fly in the ointment, and that was COVID, and the massive upsurgence of, of um, need for care providers for it to completely fall apart in terms of, you know, the, the stability of the workforce. Arguably, it wasn't great beforehand, and it is at unprecedented um uh you know compassion fatigue levels now and that's not good for anybody so i don't want this to all be doom and gloom um i guess the the thing that you know we can hang our hat on in terms of you know all of you as thought leaders is what do i need to examine about what probably wasn't working before that now it's our opportunity because you now have a seat at the table um good retention and um, workplace respect and collaboration, these are table stakes now. People will stay, they won't join your organization unless they can depend on, on that. And not only that, there are probably some indicators beforehand that we, if we had taken a closer look, we wouldn't be experiencing some of the, the, you know, the workforce challenges and strains. So look at the indication, the data that existed before COVID Now's the perfect time to go back and examine that with fresh eyes, because now it's it's perhaps a crisis for you in your workplace, for you in your industry, and uh, and look at it like knowing what I know now. What will we do going forward? Um, so I I welcome you to think of this as the the great you know talent level playing field. HR is now invited, or those of you with the you know a passion for people, you have now been invited to sit on the throne at the strategy table, take it before that throne is given to somebody else. Um, use this as time for massive, uh, important culture and, and workforce planning and, and financial transformational conversations. Sarah, with the background in HR and organizational development, have you seen trends like this before? Yes, I mean, think about what happened in the 90s where we had a, a many of us had a belief that our job or our corporation was there to support us for life we had a pension we had um we had benefits we we had a loyalty from our employer and then uh we had massive right sizing and, and downsizing 
And now we see on the other side of that, one of the, the fallouts of that is we don't have the same level of loyalty of people. So, you know, it's very easy. There's been this whole movement of talking about the intergenerational workforce and how much more disloyal our millennials are and what's going to happen with the quote trophy generation. And there's a lot of blaming the generations, blaming the victims, so to speak, about about these things. But actually, they watch their parents have their their the psychological safety dismantled and they saw the impact that had on if vacations could be afforded and if they their were they were able to have their schooling paid for the way they thought it might be and and it, it they saw their parents under stress and so they didn't expect that the workforce would be a safe loyal consistent place they, the research recently, well, not too long ago, said that people will have seven jobs in their lifetime or, you know, careers. And now we're seeing, they're saying it's 13. And some people are starting to, to look at that and say it's going to be more than 13. And why? Because some of the massive trends that we don't really talk about much anymore are part of our, our um, internal belief system. Um, about work. So if the psychological contract of generations gone by is work somewhere, you work somewhere for life, they're loyal to you, you're loyal to them. And therefore the paycheck and the pension is what is your social contract. Take away that social contract and what do you have to replace it? You have to have a psychologically safe workplace. It has to be innovative. You have to be able to grow. You have to feel valued. And again, this is where it comes back to recognition. If, if I believe in my workplace, if you believe Glenn or Gwen in your workplace, that you, you, you are not just a number, you are valued for your expertise. We want to know what you think. We, it's not just put on your, don't, don't uh, keep your camera off on a zoom meeting because, you know, we can't see your face. It's, we genuinely want to see if this is engaging to you. We want to gauge your expression. We want to know if, if you have ideas. We want you to share your ideas. These are some of the things that that would be. It's not about the Zoom. It's not about the Zoom. It's not about the the in person meetings. It's not about you know are people communicating well. It, those are all. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all hiding the real stuff that's going on, and that is that people are not. And we don't have a workforce that all truly feel I belong. I'm seen. I'm valued, I'm heard, I feel connected, I feel a sense of, of meaningful work, I feel that this organization is making choice that are the right ones for the customer and for the staff and for, for all pe people involved. So examine, ex examine you know, you, this through the lens of, if you were to fast forward five years from now and you were to write the ending of the long tail of, of the fallout of, of the organizational transformations that can come out of COVID, what will be the story that your workplace will written, will write? Even if it started with a oh, sort of, you know, chaos story that you might be in right now, what will be the end of that story? And that's where, where we didn't write the end of stories like trends such as right sizing and downsizing. And therefore we were totally caught off guard with the disloyalty and disengagement that we saw on the other side of it and that that would last for generations. So write the end of your own story, be the master of that story. And when you know what that story is, you can reverse engineer your workforce policies. You can reverse engineer some solid appreciation of your people so that they hang with you and stick with you as you're transforming your comp and benefits programs, your your workplace safety programs, your you know way in which you build a greater and a new ways of working in, in a hybrid work environment, even if you're physically bricks and mortar still like healthcare, how do you reinvent and that they're willing to be with you because this is the direction of where we're going, this is where the story ends, and that there's a there's a passion and a belief that that's the that's the place where they want to end with you and co-create it with people. Because a lot of a lot of work has been done on people. This is the time where it is uh, there is no more do we we do to people, we do with people because where the value is created at the point of the the transaction, the point of the the, the direct care provided, that is where the value added work is and therefore we in HR in organizational development 
at the senior leadership table, all of those positions I've been in, if we're not listening to where the value is created and having those people co-create what needs to happen now and into the future, then we don't, we frankly, we haven't earned our people anyway. So they're going to leave us and, um, and, and they would be justified to do that because we haven't demonstrated that we are in partnership in this thing that we call work. Sarah, as we're speaking about the trends, you've shared in some LinkedIn articles that you feel there's um, their answer to this. It's such a massive issue that it's almost hard to believe. What can we do to begin to address this? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the question and it might just be my volume is turned down. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Sure, uh, you've shared in some LinkedIn articles that you feel there are answers to this. It's such mm. a massive issue that it's almost hard to believe. Yeah. What can we do to begin to address this? Mm -hmm. Well, recognition is the fastest, easiest thing that you can do individually, that, that you can role model for people, that at a peer-to-peer -peer level, there can be greater acknowledgement and appreciation to each other. Recognition is the, the key cultural glue and connective glue. I, I actually love Brene Brown's, um, her, her definition of connection. It's the energy that exists when people feel seen, heard, and valued. I think we can all agree we need to reestablish connection, we need to infuse some healthy energy into organizations, and that every person watching this and every person that is in your organization needs to feel seen, heard, and valued. And, and frankly, when they do, they will, as we talked about earlier, there'll be greater trust in the organization, satisfaction with leaders, intention to stay, continuous improvement and innovation, and overall engagement. So the data on, on recognition exists, um, we are talking about needing to create and reinvent and, and um, you know, uh, find new ways of connecting and in new ways of working, such as a hybrid work environment. And so recognition is a key way to do that because that is how you how people feel seen, heard and valued. And the great news is that everyone can do it. It doesn't require budget. It doesn't need a strategy. Um, it doesn't need per nobody needs permission. Every single person can do it. And in an actual fact, the ways in which people want to be recognized, they transcend the digital divide and they are accessible to everyone, whether you it's your first day on the job and you've never physically met anybody to you've been there 30 years to the student who's precepting to the, the person who owns the company. Um, the three ways people want to be appreciated. Number one, 95 percent of people say, tell me, thank you. How often do we hear a genuine thank you, not just like, hey, thanks, or we sign off on an email, thanks, comment, which sort of lands, well, it's just like saying, hey, how are you? I'm fine. What does fine mean? It finds neutral, right? But I, it's a genuine, authentic thank you. 92% of people tell me specifically what I did well. So it's a personalized acknowledgement, ideally in a very timely fashion. It could be through email, it could text, uh, uh, on your virtual message board, your intranet, uh, and you know, a variety of mechanisms, as long as it's specific. And then 88% of people say um, that that they would like a thank you note. And I know a lot of people think, well, well, we can't do thank you notes in the hybrid work environment or hybrid work environment. Well, I there's all kinds of tools and systems. I now, at, at, in my, my keynotes, I have people populate kudo boards. I, I, I use a system called send out cards where I can send a card to anyone around the world and it gets printed in that country and sent directly to them. Uh, and I can make it personalized. I could take a screen capture here of all of your beautiful faces and, and send you a send out card as long as I had your mailing address. Um, and so there's, there are ways of being able to give people exactly what they've always wanted. Tell me, thank you. Tell me what I'm doing well and why you believe it's a, it, it, I'm valued and why you need what I have to offer. And why don't you put it in writing, a digital writing, handwriting, so that I hold on to it. I mean, I think we probably actually shamelessly, I actually keep a box. I don't know if anyone else does <laughs> keep a box of thank you cards. And what's so great about that is when people are struggling Let's say, you know, you and I, Gwen, are having a conversation and you say, because, you know, you and I work together and you say, oh, I've had a week. I've had, it's only, 
it's only Thursday and I don't know how I'm going to get to the end of the day tomorrow. I'm just, I could say to you, Hey, you know what? I really value you and I wish that we were together so that I could truly look you in the eye, but you know what? I, I sent you a thank you card a few weeks ago, pull it out and read it. I will feel like I actually feel that sense of connection to you. We haven't even done that with each other, right? But mm -hmm. I could you imagine that feeling in that moment where where I saw you and I heard what you were going through and that you had some kind of written anchor to that or that I could encourage you to go and take a look at any thank you card, even if the ink is fading and you could you don't even remember who this Sven guy is, but you read it and you're like, "You know what? Somebody thought it was awesome." And you put it back in your box. This is the power of recognition, and this is the easy answer to be able to, it's like the band-aid that's going to stop the bleeding right now. Every one of us can do it. I hope every person on the line is motivated to acknowledge people more. You may have some very specific things that work in your culture if they have, if they've reduced or been, been challenging to carry on because of COVID find a way to reinvent them, ideally reinvent them with people um, so that you find the way that it sticks and keep doing the things that are working. And if you've not practiced any of those um, recognition strategies, there has never been a better time to start than now. I'm going to take this in consideration. <laughs> Thank Good. you so much. <laughs> Sarah, have you seen clients having successes in addressing their talent crisis? And can, can you tell us about one or two and what they did that helped? What a great question. Yes, um, I actually had, I, I spoke at a call management organization. These were inbound call centers, not telemarketers, inbound call centers. They do really important work. They answer phone calls when somebody is, let's say has, has fallen and they need to redirect them. They answer calls for a doctor's offices off, off after hours, they answer calls when when people's basements have flooded and they may lose their, you know, the, the integrity of their house's foundation. So these are very important people. Um, and it's it's not the sort of industry where people think I'm going to do that when I grow up. So they really have to be very nimble and agile in, in in recruiting people and then retaining them once they get there. Well, the the neat thing about this this um, group of people, and at least in the ones that I know in Canada, because uh, those are the those are the uh, it's mostly Canadian organizations um, that I've spoken for in this industry. Um, they've generally done a really great job of building and curating great cultures because it's run by family run businesses over multiple generations. They're very people centered. They curate their culture very carefully. However all of these trends that we've been talking about has been bigger than the strength of their culture it is and it has caused huge gaps at a time when the need for their services has increased and and not, that's an industry where it it some sectors for example the bilingual market there's always a you know a gap in that um however in in the in a unilingual speaking market it's usually it's usually manageable However, what you know, one really progressive CEO, and and I I want to say the kind of CEO where when you look at her Glassdoor ratings, hundred percent satisfaction. How many CEOs have people publicly rating hundred percent satisfaction that they would recommend working for that person? So you can tell this is a great company by the person at the top being being the person that no matter what the other things that says on Glassdoor, everybody has huge respect for her. Well. She called me up one day and she said, I, you know, we, we really want to, um, you know, leverage recognition. We really want to do even go even deeper into that of, of hardwiring a, a, a true feeling of value and meaning and purpose for everybody here so that they stay. We just don't know how to do that in, in, in a truly transformational across our whole workforce way. So what we did is we came together for a day. We actually, I, I have a, a barn that we built, <laughs> actually rebuilt, it used to be a, a barn that was built during the Second World War, rebuilt, where I used to have small group retreats and masterminds here. We haven't had, we haven't used it since COVID, but they came, it was a very small group, came here, and we looked at the Gallup's um, employee experience journey. The, the seven phases of the employee experience journey. And I like to say it's actually eight phases because the engagement, which is right in the center, is actually early uh, early uh, phase engagement and late phase engagement. As we talked about earlier in the conversation, once you hit that 10-year mark, people can really go to the side of disengage. So it's 
I actually say it's a, you know, it's an eight phase engagement. But for this company, what they did, and, and you could do something similar as well, is that we looked at the first few phases, the attract, the hire, and the onboard phases. And we looked at what they used to do that they don't do anymore. What do they do right now? And what could they do if they reimagine and there were no obstacles, no barriers, what could they do? And in the space of a day, they completely rebuilt and reimagined the most attractive way that people would know and be drawn to them and pulled to them like a magnet. And that once they, they were in the hiring process, how to keep them, how to expedite it, how to respect and recognize and value them so that it's not like you're lucky to work here the way a lot of us have there are recruitment systems, that it was like you are one of us from the very beginning. And then in the onboarding phase, they looked at ways to support both the person onboarding to be successful, as well as the people who were in the organization, so it wasn't a burden on them. So here's a great example of something that they that they did. They used to hire a lot of students. And what they found is when there wasn't a crisis of, of attracting talent, is they realized because students only stick around for about two, three years, they decided, you know what, we're not going to hire students anymore. It's perfect to go back to what had worked in the past and to really lean into the student market. Because if you know you have a student in, the, in, in, you can, by the way, you can have now hire people all over because they're no longer bricks and mortar, these businesses. But also, if you have somebody in a program, let's say you're going to school to be a paramedic and you do call, call answering for um, health crises, right? Um, you, that is the that is an, a values aligned and school academically aligned fit you're answering calls that are going to help you in your future career and that's how you pitch it. So you say first year nursing and and um, PSWs and paramedics hey we would love to provide great a great work environment you don't have to work at McDonald's no offense if anyone's from McDonald's but still. This is a great opportunity for you to get some interesting insights into your field. Stay with us for two to three years. And what we will do is we will help you in paying for your books. We will pay for your books. And so I'm motivated because now my psychological contract and my, my anchor to this company is as long as I stay, my books get paid for, my textbooks. And I know my textbooks cost, oh gosh, it costs $800, $1,000 a year. Well, for a company that has maintained and, and kept a great employee for two or three years who picks up every extra shift because they really feel engaged and they love working there, it is the biggest deal. Paying for somebody's textbooks a thousand dollars a year for two or three years, so that's only two or three thousand dollars, is way cheaper than onboarding and recruiting somebody new every three months, which was, you know, it was that was becoming the turnover the time that people were starting to leave the organization. The, the biggest turnover was at the two, three months to six month mark. So you're actually saving money. But when you hook it to something like textbooks, now I've made a psychological contract without even realizing it, then I'm with you until the end of school. So I now have, as a business owner, I now have my, my casual part-time people to fill all of my weekend spots, evening spots, call them up in a in a pinch and say, we've just had a couple of people call and say, could you please do this? You have now your nimble workforce who are super passionate and committed to you and you know when they're likely going to leave. So you actually have workforce planning. It's much shorter time frame. However, that's what we're looking at. If you can keep people two or three years, that is probably your success. Now, not every industry and in really high um, technical industries, you want to keep people a lot longer than that, and you, you and you could well be the exception to that. Um, however, in industries where you're struggling with this huge churn and burn rate, what if you could do something by reimagining your hire, your your attract, your hire, your onboarding um, phases of your workforce, your employee experience journey? And we're able to reinvent and reimagine things so that you can at least extend the length of time that people stay with you. That now, my friends, has become not only a great way to plug the dam, right? So that it's not this gushing, gushing dam where you have no more water left. You know, you're you're you've leaked out all of your great talent, but also it's a great way to test and trial what you may want to keep on the other side of this when you may possibly not have the same. Turnover, because what if in fact this what they what the owner said to me was, 
I am, I've never been more excited about the way in which we hire and retain great people as I ha am right now. So her crisis that it was, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? I don't know what the answer is. This is a terrible situation. I don't know if I'm doing this right has become, I am so excited about workforce planning. I'm so excited about what this is going to do for our culture and our marketing and our branding. I mean, it's, it's, it's got tentacles way beyond the HR function, the recruitment function. Um, there and so so just consider it as if you use the employee experience as your anchor and you you focus on how do I make sure every decision we make to rectify our current great resignation that, that you're seeing, how do we make sure it passes this test? People will say to somebody at a at a social event or uh, their community activities or to somebody who's their bestie who's really stressed in the same industry and they're 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 looking to see if the grass is greener on the other side will they say these words you've got to come and work work here and if people don't feel valued if they feel like they're just a number and if they feel that they have been just a number even at the early phases of their recruitment journey that will stick with them so if you can pass the test of people will tell other people you need to work work here, you know how now have an army of recruiters. You know have your entire workforce that it is your recruitment engine. And this is the amazing opportunity on the other side of it. By valuing people and them feeling so important and that they're not a number, they will go out and behave like they are not a number without you even having to try it. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I see a question, questions or um, we have some questions in the chat. So I'm going to okay. mix my questions with the audience um, members' questions. Uh -huh. Marlon, would you like to unmute yourself and speak with Sarah or you want me to read your question? Whichever you want. <laughs> oh, I want to hear from you. Ask me your questions. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. This is very interesting. And, 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 and I, I love that you brought the BPO or the, you know, inbound call center kind of thing. That's the industry I work with. Huh? And uh, it's been incredibly, uh, let's say an emotional roller coaster from 2020 until now. So one of the biggest things and it's not I mean, it's kind of new on the term great resignation, but it kind of ties to COVID is we try to predict when COVID would end and now we're trying to predict when the great resignation would end. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's more of a, and that's why I asked, is, is what, what do you think are the environmental or conditions in the employee-employer relationship that will have to be present consistently for the great resignation to be considered over? Um, we're seeing this fallout everywhere, like US obviously, but then also in Latin America and Philippines and APAC and all these other areas, it, 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 it's, it's just bleeding out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from our industry perspective, you know, even though we have great tools from engagement and all these other things, I, I, I wrote down psychological contract. I loved it. I'm going to use it more often now. Um, mm -hmm. But the psychological contract for a frontline agent, which is what determines our capacity to serve customers, mm -hmm. may not necessarily be there. So um, just, just from a the type of customers we receive, honestly, you know, people calling customer service because they're not happy. So right there, your psychological contract is not necessarily the best, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the environmental conditions, what, what, when do you think this will end and what, what needs to be present for us to consider the great, great resignation over, uh, notwithstanding changes in wages and all these other things that are impacting the industry. Yeah. Marlon, thank you so much for unmuting. And I think we need some claps in the chat because you are the next official professional speaker that was so articulate and I can't even believe, yeah, are you feeling the love? There's some claps in here. Um, wow, that's amazing. I, I We actually see some organizations who all around them, there is the great resignation happening. Other companies in their industries, other companies in their community, and they're not being, they're not experiencing the fallout of that. So one thing I'd like to offer us to consider is, um, is that the great resignation may be just, um, it may barely touch it, touch you, it may barely touch your industry. However, we don't necessarily have to experience the pain of it, right? Like we can, 
when we drive by, you know those, I don't know if anyone has seen those lately. Uh, not many of us are driving much. You know how when you drive down and, you, and they do a speed gauge, right? And it flashes like, ooh, you're over the speed limit. What do you do right after that, Marlon? What do you do when you drive by and it's flashing, your speed is a little higher? Yeah, obviously slow down, right? You slow down, right? <laughs> Okay, now let me ask you, stay unmuted for a second. Let me ask you, um, you're a kilometer, you're a mile down the road. What happens to your speed? Does it stay the same or does it go up again? You got to be honest now, you're on camera. Oh, no, I, I keep it down. Oh, you keep I, it down. Good for you. Yeah, I, I don't live in the U.S. So when I go to U.S., I, I keep it down. I don't want to get arrested, right? But... <laughs> There we go. External forces. I love it. Yeah, I love it. I'm so glad you do. I got to tell you, I, you know, again, we're all friends here. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't always remember to keep my, it, it takes that, that trigger, right? To, to remind you that this is an issue. So I, I'm going to answer your question in, in two ways. One is this is your flashing speed sign, right? This is your, mm -hmm. the great resignation, whether it's happening to you or not, whether it is such a pain point that it's keeping you up at night or it's, or it's just an irritant, right? Like the tag in the back of your shirt that you got to cut off later. Um, it consider it to be a flashing sign. What you choose to do, you can keep speeding and just keep doing what you always did. I'm just going to keep speeding and hope that I don't get caught. You could slow down and course correct and go, oh my gosh, there is clearly something here that is a, an environmental issue I need to slow down. Um, you could deny that that really should have been there. Like you, it immediately makes you slow down and they're like, you know what, this doesn't apply to me. I'm fine or I'm busy or whatever. I'm going to keep speeding up. You can have different reactions. The great resignation is like that too. Whether you're deeply affected by it right now or not, assume that it's never going away. Assume that the, you will forever have a, a challenge with being able to attract and retain great people who are ridiculously loyal to you. Because here's the, here's the secret, and I, I'm so sorry to have to say this, but this is the reality. We have not been ridiculously loyal to them. Now, if you're an organization that is ridiculously loyal to your people, so let's say, you know, uh, Marlon, because you just love your people, every time they have a really difficult call or they've had a difficult shift, you, you or your su supervisors are right there supporting people. You don't deserve to be treated that way. I'm so sorry. We're going to look at, we've been getting tons of inbound calls that are so malicious. We're going to go and talk to the client. We're going to advocate for you. And maybe you're even going to dump that client because you're like, you know what? My people don't deserve to be treated that way. I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is, reduce some profits because I deserve they need to be treated better. Or you're going to add a message at the beginning of your, you know, when people call, hi, we're going to be answering your call, your conversation very quickly. Remember, we will deserve, deliver the best service to you when you deliver your greatest, most respect, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's all kinds of things that we can do. So it's the, the way in which we need to consider the great resignation is that we have we have we have chosen a position we've chosen that it's a flashing sign that we are going to respond to and we're going to get really serious about it. and we're going to assume the worst case scenario and we're going to put do everything we possibly can to make the employee experience so delicious people would never imagine leaving the industry let alone leaving your organization and your supervisors um if you see it as a temporary flashing sign where you slow down for a little bit and you keep speeding up then you're probably not going to have sustainable solutions and you may experience not what is a global trend or a, even as an industry trend of the great resignation, you may find that you're never going to have a stable workforce or maybe you didn't have it before. And so this is just an example of how you were at risk before. Um, you could also decide that it doesn't apply to you and you're just going to keep on, you know, um, having that crisis and you're going to blame everybody else because, you know, it's an industry thing. This is what we did in healthcare. It's a turnover thing. Every, you know, all throughout healthcare, it's an industry thing. You know, we can't really get around it. Well, you know, not some organizations don't. They have great engagement. They have great satisfaction. They have great retention. There's always an exception to the rule. So, so in, you know, just to set, kind of summarize, I know I, I use a lot of metaphors there, Marlon, and thank you so much for asking the question. If you assume, it's not about assuming the worst, it's assuming that this trend is here to stay. And that if it's, it's here to stay to serve you, how is it actually a, a gift? How is it the greatest gift of giving you the, the, the uh, focus as a leadership team and as a business and even as an industry? Like, 
advocate for your next corporate um, conference, your association conference to like dive deep into this so that your entire industry comes out as the most transformed industry as a result of this flashing sign. Don't, don't deal with it alone. Deal with it as an industry so that you come out as like the victorious champions in all of this because that's the power of the pain. If you're gonna feel the pain, you might as well have huge gains on the other side of it. And just like lifting weights is gonna feel really off, right? When you first get going, you're gonna get sweaty. It's gonna to be tough, but you're not gonna get caught. You're not gonna get caught on the other side of it. In fact, you may be so, so grateful for this crisis, um, not COVID crisis. Nobody's gonna feel great about a crisis. <laughs> Millions of, you know, like millions of dollars and millions of lives and all that stuff. I mean, the great resignation crisis. Yep. How, how will this be? So let me ask you in five years from now, if, if it was, here we are another amazing session uh, led by Gwen. And you're, you're going to say to us, that was the best workforce transformational opportunity of our business and of our industry. What will you be saying as to why that was an incredible opportunity for transformation. Here it is five years from now. Tell us, 2026. That is a, that is a great question. So from, from my industry perspective, getting rid of brick and mortar sites is one of the biggest opportunities that we've taken overall. And you mentioned it before, right? Brick and mortar is not a thing. So, so it brings back life work balance to certain people have, have you know, been able to work from home. Uh, it flexibilizes our opportunities to source talent from different places in the world as well, or different areas within the same city. So I think that that is the the, the biggest takeaway I would have. Um, prior to the pandemic, many of our clients would you know just persignate over the idea of work from home, like you know I'm not ever doing that. Uh, now it's 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 integral part of their VCP plans, you know the business continuity plans, and and I think that's a great takeaway. For me, in five years from now, everyone will be working from home. Going yeah. to the center will be so 90s. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So there you go. You've got your delicious anchor to have a conversation with your leadership folks and to say, wow, our organization is the most flexible, uh, adaptable, um, curious place about where we can find the best people that we just, and we just, everyone loves working here because we are, we are, we prioritize um, you know, the healthiest, most dynamic work experience for people. Wow. And now you get a chance to go and reverse engineer it because you have this opportunity for transformation. I'm so excited for you. We'll have to con con connect in 2026 to, uh, to chat about that. Or maybe we'll chat it. I'll see you at an industry conference. Who knows? Yeah. I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Thank you, Sarah. Another question is from Demetrius, but he is in the train and thank you for joining oh. us from the train <laughs> and he asked me to ask you the question um what would be your way of building connection report in the hybrid world we are living in yeah so building building connection in a hybrid environment um, this is actually a very growing question as the focus of, of some keynotes that I'm delivering um, uh, this December. Um, recognition, I'm going to go back to that. When people feel valued and appreciated, then they feel a greater sense of connection with each other. Um, and remember how we talked about the second most uh, preferred way that people want to be appreciated is when we tell them specifically what we acknowledge and what we appreciate about each other. So that requires requires connection. I have to pay attention to you. I have to see what you value. I have to, um, you know, have a, have a desire to build you up by, by actually expressing it in whatever medium that that is. Um, so connection isn't about, do people put their zoom cameras on or, or, you know, do they show up to meetings? It's that do people see each other and acknowledge what's working so that people are motivated to do more of that for, for their own intrinsic motivation and also for the extrinsic motivation of being part of something bigger than them. And that's one of the, the key things about a work environment that's different than working for yourself. You, you cannot replace that sense of connection by working for yourself in the same way. 
So find ways to rebuild if you if you've lost some of the traditions and the rituals that worked well for building connections, such as you haven't had any leadership training or staff sessions or um, maybe you're you used to go for dinner together when somebody you know had a promotion find ways to evolve that so that it rebuilds that sense of connection. A complaint is a poorly worded request. So if people are saying, I feel disconnected, they're not complaining, they're saying, I seek connection. So you've done connection well in the past, rebuild it. The, the whole water cooler effect was, uh, we, we like to think that we had a sense of connection because we physically saw each other. That, spoiler alert, that wasn't real connection. That was coincidental being in the same place. Um, real connection is the people that you saw at the water cooler, but when you left, you still stay connected with them. You, you know what? You still remember that they have two kids like you do, that they that they like jazz dancing or whatever it is. If you if if we know about what matters to people, and if we find ways to to curate that so that we can keep learning about each other and caring about each other and growing that and expressing that appreciation, then that is people feeling true, truly seen, heard, and valued, like the, you know, that quote that I shared with you earlier. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it looks like there's no much time uh, left. We have one question for Rafi Cole and a few more in my private chat, but there's no time. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to show this your audience said about the thank you cards. Uh, oh, let me unmute someone. So I'm keeping them as well. And this card is from uh, Sarah. Yay. I'm glad you have it. Yay. And uh, other goods that she sent to me. I'm keeping everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those are compliment cards. Yeah, that was yeah. the compliment so cards. Yeah. <laughs> All these from Sarah, and thank you so much for being a role model of how to express our gratitude and how to make someone's um, life a little bit more, you know, happier. And thank you for taking time today to speak with me and speak with other uh, Harvard Business School uh, graduates and participants of different programs. I have shared your LinkedIn uh, link in the chat and mine as well, and others shared their um, LinkedIn pages. So if there's any other questions, you, they are welcome to reach out to me or to you. And um, yeah, if you're reaching out, uh, if you're joining us from the US, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Mm. And thank you again, sir, it was lovely to have you today. Oh, I'm so glad to be here and please don't hesitate to reach out. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know how I can serve um, and uh, hop over to my website, greatestbankify.com because I'm releasing blogs every single week about this very issue. So um, if there's any content there that would be of value to you, you're feel, feel free to take it, share it um, and let's stay connected because we're obviously the converted. So let's let's do this in community across the world. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and I want to take a group photo. One second. Oh, yes, we have to turn on our cameras. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I was sharing some content on my Instagram while you were answering. The wow, question. multitasking. So, <laughs> yeah. So I want to take a picture now. Great. Mm -hmm. So you will find these on my Instagram page. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to seeing you hopefully in two weeks. We're going to have a networking session. But if by the time I'm in the labor, um, we may cancel that event. But <laughs> I will still schedule something before New Year so we can get in touch and have another um, networking event. So it was very nice to see all of you. Thank you again, Sarah. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you for Bye. attending.